Welcome to Detect and Protect, the Australian Biosecurity Podcast. This series is about sharing information on biosecurity and the difference this makes to our lives. Every year, lots of animals and plants are imported into Australia and they have to meet strict biosecurity conditions. When they arrive in Australia, these animals and plants spend a bit of time in our post-entry quarantine facility in Victoria. The team at the PEQ facility play a vital role ensuring that our import conditions are met and what's imported isn't going to pose a biosecurity risk. Today, we'll be learning more about what the team does, why their work is so important, and some of the interesting things that they've encountered. Joining me today is Megan from the Post Entry Quarantine Facility. Thanks for joining us, Megan. Welcome. So, the first and I suppose the biggest question is what is post entry quarantine and why is it so important for our biosecurity? Post-entry quarantine is essentially a period of time that animals and plants, after they've arrived in Australia, undergo so that we can go through the necessary tests and checks to ensure that they've met their permit conditions and the onshore arrival conditions. Lots of different animals get imported into Australia all the time. What are the main types of animals that you see coming through the PEQ facility? The main types of animals we see are cats and dogs. Um, we have horses, birds, um, chickens and ducks, and occasionally pigeons um, and bees. So Australia's got very strict conditions for animal imports, including cats and dogs, and presumably the bulk of these animals are, are people's pets. Why are the conditions so strict? Mostly because of the diseases that are quite common overseas that we don't have here and we don't really want here. Imagine a, a, an Australia where we had rabies um, and it got out into our native population and you couldn't, you know, rescue kangaroos or koalas just in case those straps will bit you. Um, stray dogs on the street. And there's so many other diseases that could potentially come in. I mean, our EI outbreak recently. That's the equine influenza, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, that has the potential to, to decimate our racing industry. Um, it, it goes to our way of life. We have a very relaxed way of life here. And I think if we had a lot of diseases that are overseas, it wouldn't be quite so relaxed. For sure. So these are, these are very, very strict, but it's very strict for a very good reason. Yeah, because there's, there's also a lot of money that Australia generates through its agricultural industry and our racing industry and tourism and all of that is tied up with our very unique flora and fauna that could be de could be damaged with an incursion of um, any of these pests or diseases. And it, it could be even uh, you know simpler sort of uh, way of life things like not worrying about the the dog you see on the street having rabies and uh, you know <laughs> not being concerned you're about to be bitten by a rabid dog and and have your life changed for the worst in a very short period of time. Well, yeah, I mean, rabies is an interesting one because there's 56,000 people worldwide die of it every year um, and there is no known treatment. Once symptoms appear in 99% of cases, person dies. So that's, that's the big thing to, to have to live with. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good reason uh, to, to keep it out of that country. So, so previously, the cats and the dogs, they had to stay for quite an extended period of time in, in PEQ, but, but now they only need to stay for 10 days. What's the story behind that? Um, so in 2012, there was a review conducted of the um, post-entry quarantine process, um, and essentially they decided that um, a lot of the tests and stuff that we did the treatments we performed here in that 30 days could be taken care of offshore um, through the health certification program with the OIE. Mm -hmm. And so this, so that means uh, people that are wanting to bring their pets back into the country, if they do a bit of legwork and a, a bit of paperwork before they arrive, it, it's going to mean that they can uh, get to see their pets sooner? Yeah, so it's not so much that they have the option. They do have to do these offshore right. and, and tests, um, but it does shorten that period that they have to stay in quarantine for you quite, quite significantly. Well, I mean, it's got to be one of the, the toughest things. I've never had to do it myself, but uh, I can imagine being separated from your fur babies for an extended period of time and potentially on the other side of the country, you know. Um, and it must be, you know, such a relief when when they finally get out of post-entry quarantine. I'm, I'm sure you've seen a number of things and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen 
owners reunited with their pets and vice versa. Are there any good stories, anything that stands out to you? Um, releases is an emotionally draining process, but it's actually one of the most rewarding processes that we do at PQ. Um, we get to see that reunion over and over again, and it's probably one of the, the nicest parts of the job is being able to wheel out that pet yeah, I, 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 I believe it for sure. It's, uh, you know, so, sometimes uh, these these are people's uh, only companions. These are these are these are partners for life. And, you know, it's uh, it's got to be a stressful, a stressful time. So as someone who uh, works in this space, I'm going to assume that you're an animal lover. Did you need certain qualifications or experience to, to get the job down at the at the facility? Um, I, I didn't. I came from a, a different unit. I'd, I'd previously worked at the airport and also in the commercial import space as a document assessor. Um, I think I was a man, I love animals, um, and I think that's probably the main qualification for getting the job. We we have lots of different types of qualifications of people at the PQ. We've obviously got our horticulturalists and that sort of thing, but we've also mm-hmm. got people with animal behaviour degrees and backgrounds in shelters and kennels and that sort of thing but there's also a lot of people like me who just love animals and just want to work with them and um have learnt lots and lots of stuff along the way from from people and from the training that we receive which is probably second to none in the in the kennel space and but yeah i think probably the main qualification is loving animals that makes sense. And, you know, it's a, it's a common thread we're finding. Uh, a couple of episodes we interviewed the detector dog uh, handlers, and that was, I think, their primary criteria as well. They are both uh, dog lovers and, and, and animal lovers, and they've both said that, you know, the job is, is rewarding, uh, not just because of the specific quarantine and biosecurity training, but because they get to, to work with these animals and, you know, they're their partners. And uh, it seems to be a consistent thread. I'm sure our listeners are maybe aware of a little while ago, a, a, a fairly well-known celebrity got in trouble for, for not following the right conditions when bringing their dogs into into Australia. Have we had any celebrity pets come through post-entry quarantine? Because the rules apply to anyone. It doesn't matter how many movies you've starred in. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. The the rules still apply. Um. Yeah, so we have had some pets come through. Um, Unfortunately, I can't name them because of, of privacy. We did have, although we do have, I did have one I can mention. Um, we had Kate Walsh recently during COVID moved to Australia, to sunny Western Australia. And she brought her animal, Pablo and Rosie, and we had the pleasure of looking after them. Um, and recently saw they settled in beautifully. But it's not just people who have are celebrities. We actually have some animal celebrities that come through every right. year. We every year we have what we call the Shark and Sally, which is um, they come over for the breeding season. And this year we have two Triple Crown winners. I must say I, I get a little bit um, starstruck <laughs> with the with the Shuttle Stallions sometimes because they are quite famous names, but. You get a wide variety of things when you work in in the field of biosecurity. That's that's for sure. We've 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 covered the cats and the dogs. We've talked about horses, live plants. Are there certain plants that need to go through post entry quarantine, and why? So there's approximately about a thousand different species that need to come through um, the PDQ. Things like um, grapes, potatoes, a lot of fruit species, um, berry crops. Um, ornamentals, forestry species, um, there's yeah, about a thousand different. And and the reason they, they need to come through is because they're subject to high risk pets um, and they need to be grown out in a secure facility to make sure that they're not harboring those diseases. 
Sure. And a lot of these days with uh, access to, to online stores, people who are interested in, you know, you've mentioned grapes, you've mentioned a, a range of popular plants, things that backyard gardeners, not just farmers, not just uh, people in the agriculture sector, backyard farmers and hobbyists are interested in this kind of thing. But it's important that they, they realise that we take these things into post-entry quarantine to let the plants grow uh, so that we can uh, test and screen them for disease. And they've got to understand that that good deal that they see online may end up costing a lot more for them. Um, and the risk is that it costs the Australian economy a lot more than that as well. Yeah. Well, Australia's agricultural industry generates about $29 billion worth of income every year and 63,000 people rely on it for their jobs. Mm. Um, and if the wrong thing gets out, that can, can cause a lot of damage. <laughs> Absolutely. And the next question I suppose I had, and it does does relate to this because we're talking high risk and important, uh, important industry, important sector and a very iconic animal. I understand we've recently imported some bees for the first time in about 15 years. How, how are bees imported, first of all, and uh, why are they imported? Yeah, so they, they come in in little boxes with a fly screen top. Um, not particularly luxurious accommodation, but <laughs> effective. Um, and essentially, so the, the two queens that we recently, that were recently imported, um, came from the Netherlands and they are varroa resistant genetics. Right. So the hope is that they will then generate offspring that will be resistant to varroa mites. And while the royal might is a presence currently in Australia, the danger is that it always will. One, one of the most, uh, well, we're one of the last countries in the world not to have Varroa and there's no cure. There's no way to get rid. Once Varroa destructor is here, it's very unlikely that we'd ever be able to get rid of it. So it makes sense that we're, first of all, not importing any bees at all to make sure that it doesn't come that way. And uh, importing bees for research makes makes perfect sense as well, because there's a, no country's ever managed to eradicate it. And it's a, it's a pretty gruesome, pretty gruesome little Little, little bug. And and we rely on bees for so many things. The pollination of our fruit crops and they're just they're essential to to, to law. Exactly. Yep, absolutely. And so we've got queen bees from the Netherlands, we've got superstar horses, we've got celebrities, dogs, we've got people's cats. What's the strangest or most interesting, if those didn't count, <laughs> that you've seen come through the facility? Um, we had recently a, what they call a mammoth donkey from the US. So a, a mammoth donkey? It's a horse-sized donkey, so <laughs> okay. 16 hands, which is quite large for donkey. And um, he had ears that I'm pretty sure NASA were using to pick up signals from the Mars rover. They were huge. They were <laughs> two feet in length. And his bray could be heard all over the facility. It was you'd be down in dogs or at security and you could hear him <laughs> braying. He was so loud. And everyone knew when he was about to start braying because he would inhale his mouth open up wide and then be like Rrr. um and it was odd because then the next, very next confinement, we had miniature dogs that were about the same size as a Labrador. Well, you know, that, like I was saying before, I think, you know, part, part of the interest, part of the satisfaction of working in the field of biosecurity isn't, isn't just protecting Australia's environment and the economy. It's just the, the things that you see on an on a almost daily basis that you, most other people don't, don't see or even think about. Yeah. And I mean, it's not even just the... The interesting animals like the donkeys, um, we have so many weird and wonderful cats and dogs that come through. We had a cat um, a while ago who ate spinach. It wouldn't eat. And the owner said, try spinach. She liked spinach. And I, I happened to have spinach, a bag of spinach with my lunch that day, and I gave him some. And it was like, oh, thank God dinner's here. <laughs> <laughs> When I get home this evening, I'm going to try and feed my cat some spinach. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'll let you know. Anyone else. But he, <laughs> and, and, I mean, yeah, we have 
people pay, they, people spoil them. <laughs> so they, they, they eat all sorts of interesting things, but that, that's probably the, the strangest thing, cat eating spinach. <laughs> no, that's, that's certainly the strangest thing that, that I've heard today. So that's the, uh, the overview, I suppose, and the more curious things that you come across. But the PEQ facility isn't just about processing animals and plants. There's a, a, a lot of uh, innovation and research work going on down there as well. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, so the plant space is, is where probably the most interesting innovation is going on. Um, it's colloquially known as Picket Tech, which but it stands for Plant Innovation Centre at Post Central Quarantine. Um, so the plant guys are looking at new ways of testing to try and shorten the amount of time the, animal, the plants need to spend in in quarantine um, and finding new ways of, of um, getting the plants through on a on a better on a in a better turf. Um, and so yeah, they're trying to they're trying to reduce it from a two to three year period to a six to twelve month period. So that sounds like it would be yeah absolutely a massive time gain and um in line i suppose with the the the, the reduction of the time that the animals so the cats and dogs have to spend here as well i guess it's a good demonstration that that we we're aware that it can be difficult uh, for a variety of reasons to to send your loved ones or your your nursery stock to this facility and um we are taking steps to, to to reduce the um the burden on the importers as well as us and so if any of our listeners are considering importing plants or bringing their pets to australia what's the take-home message for them that you'd like to give today um i think probably the the biggest thing we'd like people to know is that as demonstrated by COVID, our what our lifestyle and our economic health and our environment can be damaged by pest and disease and while the process can often be hard and, and confusing and long it's not for nothing it is for a purpose it is so that we can protect our very unique flora and fauna our way of life and our economic stability and from an animal person's perspective people just need to always remember that you know we, we love them like they're our own and we're doing our best to to protect australia from all the nasties that the rest of the world seems to have and and we don't want well, it, it makes a lot of sense when you put it like that, I think it's fair to say. Well, thanks, Megan. We're, we're, we're about out of time, but this has been a fascinating chat. Um, we, we really appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate uh, the work that you and, and your team down there do. So thanks very much uh, for, for coming along. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. So thanks to Megan again, and thanks to our listeners for tuning into the podcast. You can find more information on Australian biosecurity on the department's website or by visiting biosecurity.gov.au. Links and details will be in the description of this episode. Make sure you subscribe to our podcasts to get updates on future topics and learn more about Australian biosecurity. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again soon.